Welcome to another um, online meeting for Discrete Mathematics, MTH129. Um, and so uh, the assignment's due um, shortly, and so I'm just going to look at that um, to begin with. So you, so one question that someone here has asked is about set notation. Um, so let's have a, an example set of, um, of articles in English. Okay, so I've just got a set. Um, so an article is a part of speech in English grammar. Um, and so the answers are, I mean, I can write them down. So, so a set basically means a bunch of stuff. So, you know, well, the articles in English are a, an, and the, or the, depending on it's two different ways. But so writtenly, there's just three articles. There's actually not that many cho choices to, to come from. So that's the bunch of things. And we just want to write that as a set. So set means write it as a bunch of things. And so the normal notation of a set is to use curly braces. So um, I'll type it up too. Um, so it's A and the curly braces. Um, that's how you type it up. Um, so you can use those curly braces. To in, so you, you basically put a bunch of things in curly braces to say you've got a bunch of things there. And then you just list them all. And so when you've got a, um, so that's one way of doing set notation. So if you can easily list everything in it, that's perfectly acceptable. And so that can work for some things. Um, and so if you had the, um, set of a um, negative odd integers or something like that. You could do the same sort of thing. You could go, oh, I've got a set, and I could just, so that's my curly brace. I could say, well, I've got negative one, negative three, negative five, etc. And that's just a way of listing all the elements. Now, the difference between these two sets here, as you can see, is the first one only has three elements in it. So it's fine, I can write them all down quite easily. This one here has an infinite number. So countably infinite, but I still can write them down and list them in a sensible way. So this is just simple set notation, and that's quite acceptable. Some things um, can't be written that way. Um, you can't, and so in particular, uncountably infinite sets, you can't really just list all the elements so easily. And so you have to use other things like set builder notation for that sort of situation, which I can explain if you want to. Um, but in terms of the question that was asked earlier, um, the sort of set notation that for simple stuff, it really just list all the other things in curly braces you know, is the, the key idea. Um, so did that answer, I know, give you enough of a hint for the question you had in, in your mind? Yeah, cool. So, and just another thing, I mean, this is, as I said, um, this set here is countably infinite, so this negative voltages as I've listed here. If I then just underneath write down the order, so one, two, three, four, etc., the um, the connect, the position it is in this list I've made, and the element itself is the as a one-to-one -one correspondence between the positive counting numbers or positive natural numbers and the set actually proves it's countable. So being listed like this proves it's countably infinite. And so the the one to correspond correspondence would be sending a number, say n, counting number one, two, three. So one goes to minus one, two goes to minus three, three goes to minus five, just to think of a way of doing that. So that would be um, I don't know, something like um, minus two n plus one, for example, seems to satisfy that sort of rule. By looking at it, and that would be our one to one correspondence. 
So you can see them. So by listing it, you can see them all, etc. Anyway, um, so I can just see someone else has joined on. Um, if you've got any questions of, uh, relating to the assignment, um, feel free to ask now. Um, that's what we're just covering, and then we'll just about to move on to um, looking at numbers in different bases um, as well. So if you've got anything, um, please let me know, and I'll I'll have a look at it since it is, seems to be topical. Cool. So. Um, so interrupt me if you need to. So um, what I want to look at now is um, looking at doing numbers in different bases. So um, this um, is covered, also covered in a subject that some of you might have done or may not have done um, called ITC 161, um, which is about introduction to computer systems. So if you haven't done it, it's okay. I mean, it, it's sort of self-contained in a subject. Um, but yeah, so it can go either way. So, um, so I guess let's just go to um, the purpose of it all. What we're trying to think through it all. So I got some questions. I'm just gonna. Work so well. Yeah, so these questions um, are from um, my little tutorial sheet. So these are questions I do for the internal students. So I'm just going to go through them. But um, so this is shows you the reason why we do these things. So this subject is aimed um, strongly at computer science students. I mean, it's useful in its own right, but in computer science, um, numbers in a computer aren't represented using base 10. So using and base 10 would be the digits 0, 1, 2, through up to 9. Rather, they are represented internally as either just a 0 or a 1, so which is called binary. Um, and so being able to understand binary is really about a base 2, and understanding how you can deal with that is looking at numbers in different bases. Um, and so a key idea is looking at, at binary. And although, um, so the good thing of binary is that um, it's actually efficient in terms of storage space and it's simple in terms of circuit design, etc. cetera. Um, the downside to it is if you have tried to write it down on a piece of paper, um, then they can become really long. And so a useful way of dealing with binary is to actually write it using a different base, so base 16, um, which was hexadecimal, which is a way of abbreviating it effectively. And so a key skill in computer science or just anything with IT is being able to go between binary and hexadecimal and decimal. So there are sort of three common um, things you need to do. Um, so that's what these questions are, which I'll, I'll cover in a second. But um, in order to try to understand that, um, it's good to be able to understand just what do you do with different bases in general? So uh, questions I have in mind is uh, I won't always do binary. I pick base six just because there's just a middle number of digits, so to speak. Um, so looking at base six, you just want to be able to convert between different bases, being an add in different bases, etc. Just think of how you do those sort of stuff. And if you can do it, you can understand pretty much how a computer works. So a computer really does work things in base two. That's how it really works at the heart of it. Um, now, the most efficient base in terms of memory capacity is base 3, as a matter of fact. Um, so base 3 is the smallest base capacity, um, which means, and, and how that works is that, um, so each digit, so even for base 10, for example, um, how much space a number takes in base 10 is each digit has to be one of 10 different options. So you have to allow for 10 options for each digit, then times by the number of digits, essentially, is the um, sort of how much space it takes up. Um, and so base three ends up being the most efficient with base two um, just behind it. And so therefore, um, in computer systems, sometimes you find that um, you have things like a prefix, um, so a lookup tree, which is used for you know, storing a dictionary of different words, or lookup tables, whatever it might be. 
Um, if you want to make them efficient in terms of storage space, um, then a tree which is lit, which is tied to base through, is really helpful. And the assignment uh, two mentions that, um, alludes to that, etc. So uh, different bases have other uses, I guess is the key thing. But let's just focus on um, these two questions for the moment. I don't quite know who you're up to. So um, any Compute, anything that's connected to a, um, a network has a, a MAC address. Um, there are two types of MAC addresses, um, depending on the size. So this one's the MAC 48, happens to do my computer, essentially. Um, and so 48 is the number of binary digits, or called bits for short. So it's 48 bits is how long it is. And so if you write it all in terms of so each, bit is either a 0 or 1, so if you have to write it out fully, it would be 48 characters long, a lot of characters. Um, and so what they do is they said write it in binary, in so hexadecimal. So um, each digit here, written in this code, and you can, this is written on the back of my um, laptop, for example, um, each of these digits corresponds to four binary digits, so four of them. And so if you count them all up, um, there's 12 things there. So they're each broken up into um, two at a time. So each of these blocks is eight bits. And you can see there's six of them. So six lots of eight is 48. It gives you 48 bits in total. So each of these things is called an octet because there's eight bits in them. I don't know how much you know, but I just sort of filling in the blanks in case you don't know. So um, in a MAC address, um, basically it's long enough to make it um, virtually unique, that's the intention. They make them 48 is supposed to be long enough. Um, they've got a high number, just to be really sure they have other ones. Um, I'll go back to your questions in a second, but um, for sure. So I'll just answer this and I'll, I'll come back to the assignment. So um, for the first octet here, it's good just to translate it. So this is eight zero in hexadecimal. So this is hex, and what I want to do is I want to write this in terms of binary. And so basically go from one to the other, it really is just useful to know the conversion between the two. So binary, so hex decimal, um, the, the eight there corresponds to eight, and so I just want to write what um, eight looks like in binary. So does anyone know? And I'm not sure if you guys know the answer. I can explain a bit more if you want to. So, um, as you guys are thinking, so um, if we do the numbers in, um, so I'll just do as many as I can from the page. Um, so this is the decimal, so 1 up to 11. So I'm going to write down binary and hexadecimal. So in binary, um, it looks like 1, hexadecimal looks like 1, 2. So for binary, when you get to two, you don't have a digit for two. So you really have to um, you have to write one lot of two and no lots of one. In hexadecimal, it's one. Sorry, two, I should say. I'm talking about. So in binary, um, you've got one lot of two and one lot of one, which gives you three in total. Four is one lot of four, no twos, no ones, etc. So there's a nice little pattern here. And so for 8, for example, as someone said, is you've got one lot of 8, no 4s, no 2s, no 1s. So it gives you 8 all up. And I'll just write the last few down. So in hexadecimal, um, basically the numbers 1 up to 9, um, you write down just like you think it to be. But when it comes to 10, you write down A. And when it comes to 11, you write down B. And for 12, 13, and 14, 15, you do the same thing. Just keep using letters. So C, D, E, and F. And basically, hexadecimal means you've got 16 different characters. So when you get to 16, you write that down as one lot of 16 and no lots of 
um, ones. So it looks like a, looks like ten, but I would read it as one zero. So back to this one here. That's a little lookup table effectively. So the eight in binary will be one zero zero zero, and a zero in hex would be zero 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 in binary. And I need to put all the four zeros down because it really corresponds to a four bit, four, four, four binary digits essentially. So this first octet here looks like this. Um, now, why do you have to, so who cares is maybe what you're thinking. So this is how it's addressed on the back of your computer. Why do we have to think, realize the binary? Well, sometimes some of these bits are important. So in this particular case, so I pick MAC addresses, is that um, this last two um, bits, the last two characters here, actually have a me uh, meaningful. So the seventh one, um, so the seventh one really is called the local universal bit, and depending on the value, it tells you if it's um, locally or universally addressable. So in this case, what are the two? Is it is it local or is it universal? Yep, so universal, and um, the last one, the one in green here, is if it's uni or multicast. So which of the two is it here? Okay, that's right. So being able to just go from hex to binary, just pulling out some bits when you need to is a really important skill when you sort of stuff. Um, sometimes, and it's written in hex, but you go, well, I'd like to know what the numerical value is and go backwards and forwards. So um, let's just pick on... Um, say the seventh, the fifth octet here is D0 and AB. Let's just do these two. So D0 is in hex and so is AB. I want to convert these into decimal this time. So let's think what, what's the value that we would normally talk about. So we're not really carrying the bits, which are critical, but just actual numerical value. So it's base 16. So the first is D, and you think, well, what does D correspond to? Well, D is 13. So the first digit really is 13 in our thinking, but this is the 16s column. So it's 13 times by 16. That's, a, that's only 16. And this is you've got no plus no lots of 1. So you're doing um, 13 times 16, and in an exam or anything like that, or assignment situation, you can just pull out your calculator and get the answer. What you do here. Um, it's um, 8 um, you know what, I want to pull up my own calculator that's the easiest thing to do so 208 is the answer um, so the way to convert to so AB from hexadecimal to to bomb um, from a hex decimal. The A, looking up, um, is here, so that's 10. So you've got 10 in the 16s column, plus B, and if you look it up, B is 11, so plus 11 in the ones column. So 10 times 16, 160, plus 11 gives you 171. So that's how you go from hexadecimal to decimal. And you can do the same thing for binary, it just takes a bit longer. You just, um, so hexadecimal to binary, so hexadecimal to decimal is easier, than, in my opinion. Not everyone agrees, so you have to work it out yourself, I think is the key thing. Um, so let's look at question seven. And I'll just copy it again directly. So, um, um, so you see um, things elsewhere. So this is an IP4 address. So IP4 is on the way out, I guess, but it's still commonly used. So it's um, four octets, and unlike it does not written in hexadecimal like things are commonly now. It was written in decimals, so it's four decimal numbers. But if you want to actually work at what the bits are, and say, so, and you need to know this sometimes because um, they do bit masking and so you need to 
realize what the bits actually are to see what the mark how the mask works. So you need to be able to go from a decimal to think about what the actual bits are to actually understand it properly. So the first octet is decimal, which is decimal in this case. 137. And so it's useful to be able to convert that into both hex and binary. Now we can do one or the other. Um, which one? Which one would you do first? So uh, we'll do. We want to do both. So I'm not sure how familiar you are with all this sort of stuff. So you can say I don't know. That's perfectly acceptable. But if you want to convert decimal to hex, which one would you work out first? So your options are: you can convert decimal to hex and then hex to binary, or you can convert decimal to binary and then binary to hex. So the text of binary, that's the easy one, because there's a nice correspondence. It's the um, the first step's the hard one. So any thoughts? Would you, you can say, I don't know, um, or you can say, I'd prefer hex first, or I'd prefer binary first. Okay, that's fine. So um, in my internal class, so i just tell you what they guys said in my internal class. Um, so in my internal class, um, most of the students, but not all, have done ITC 161 before. So they have seen some of this sort of stuff before. So they've had a chance to think more about it. So you, so now not everyone had. And so in that case, it's hard to have an opinion you haven't done so much of it before. And that's okay. Um, but they were very much used to converting decimal to binary. That They had that idea. And they did lots of it without a calculator. And so without a calculator, I mean, to convert just to melt from the lots of dividing by two. And so they were familiar with that. So that's what they picked in the main. Um, I personally prefer decimal to hex. So I'll show them both to you. Um, show both approaches. It just emphasizes the, the procedure. Um, and then you can make your own mind up, I guess. And at the end of the day, you can use your calculator as a help, not a problem. Um, but you're the one who has to do the work. And so you just choose which one it is. Okay, so let's just have an aside. So if you want to convert any decimal number to base n, so n can be 2 or 16 or 6 or 3, you know, any base you want to at all, the basic how you do it is you get your number, so you get x, for example, and then you divide by the base. Divide by n. So let's just have a look in the moment. So we've got 137. So we're going to divide by the base. And so the base we have in our mind is, so let's do hexadecimal, so 16. So we're going to divide it by 16. What do we get? Now, you can do it a few different ways. Um, yep, so you can pull out your calculator. I wouldn't actually write it as a so you've got options, so 8.56 is what some wrote down. Um, what I would do is using the fraction button on my calculator. So if you do the um, 1, 3, 7 um, fraction button, so A over B or something like that, I think it is, um, 16, gives you the fractions, and I'll, I'll show you why in a second. Um, so if you did that, you would get um, 8 and 9 over 16. So depending on how your calculator does it, um, it write, might write as an improper fraction, which is what I've got here, or it might write as a proper fraction. So a proper fraction would be 137 over 16. If you give it, if it gives you as a proper fraction, um, it's better to have an improper for this case, and you might have to press the, um, like it, there's a, a button which converts between the two. My calculator is really old. I just press the Shift A B button. On other people, there's a arrow and above it is the A, so what is it, um, A, B on C button or something like that. So you press shift that one, does it? All right. It depends on your brand. Unfortunately, I can't say it very generically. But I think this calculator way, so just type in 137 over 16 equals, get, improper frac get in as an improper fraction is a nice way of reading it off. Because you can see here that the answer is 8. That's called the quotient. And it also has a remainder. 
and your calculator tells you quickly the remainder here is something over 16. So whatever over 16 it is tells you the remainder. So I can see the remainder is 9. So if I do my frac my, the fraction button on my calculator effectively, it tells me both the quotient, which you can tell from the decimal version too, but also tells me the remainder, which is really important for this calculation. So back to what we've done here. The general rule to convert decimal to any base n, you just divide by n. So um, the remainder becomes the last digit. Um, the quotient, um, basically you just repeat. So let's explain what I mean by that. So in this case, the back to our example, we've done 137 divided by 16, so we've got our quotient which is 8, um, and got our remainder of 9, and so we know that the last digit is going to be 9. It's our very last digit. Um, and then we need to work out the next one along. So we need to repeat the process. We need to get 8. That's our equation. That's what we're repeating it on. And we want to divide this one by 16. So we have to work out the quotient and the remainder, I guess, both of them. So both of these parts are um, straightforward. What is the quotient? So what is the quotient and what's the remainder of this? So um, in general, uh, in this case I wouldn't maybe do it this way, but in general what I would do is type in my calculator 8 over 16 on my calculator and press equals and um, the integer, and so you get in this case um, 1 over 2, I'll mention it just for completeness. So um, notice there's no integer part, which tells you that the quotient is 0. And so therefore, um, the remainder is everything. So it's got a remainder of 8. So if you write down as a half, you have to think of it, that's half of 16. So you'd have to think of it in your head, that's equivalent to 8 over 16. And you can see the 8 there. So why I mention this is, I wouldn't bother doing all that at all. If you see 8 divided by 16, well, I can't divide 16 into that at all, and therefore must, the whole thing must be a remainder. So I wouldn't use a calculator. But... Just showing that if you did use your calculator, if it writes it as a simplified fraction, you have to convert the fraction to something over 16 or whatever it might be to get the rem that remainder out clearly. Yeah, you can use long division, lots of different ways, but let's go back to this one. So I, I did the division. First remainder comes here. Next time I've done it, then the remainder is 8. It would be my next digit, so I just keep doing it. And I want to, you sort of keep the process and you finish. when the quotient is zero. So you keep replacing, so you keep dividing by that base over and over again, keep writing the remaining down as all the different digits, and you keep going until there's nothing left. And in this case, we've got nothing left, so that's the answer. So in hexadecimal, so let's put a hash, so hash 89, which is hexadecimal, is the hexadecimal version of 137. So that's 89 in hex. And in binary, to work out the binary for it, um, is what I did before, and that is I wrote down the 8. 8 in binary, as I said before, was the 1, 0, 0. So just looking it up effectively. And the 9 in binary, looking up, um, um, so here it is over here, just looking at the bay. 9 is 1, 0, 0, 1. That's what it looks like in binary. Now, uh, as you say, I didn't. I'm not going to. I'm not calling that one million and something or other, um, or ten million. As a matter of fact, I really just read the digits out individually because it isn't ten million. It's only 137, um, and so just reading off the digits. So that's my. That's one way of converting decimal to hex to ones. That's my preferred option. Just show you how you convert to decimal to binary directly. So let's do the other way. Let's do 137. To binary directly. So basically, what I want to keep doing is I want to keep divided by two every single time. 
So if I divide um, 137 divided by 2, um, I get, um, I can't believe it's dying on me, sorry. So you get 68 um, remainder and 1. Um, then you're going to keep repeating it. So you get 68, you want to divide this one here by 2. So you're getting 34 remainder 0. And all these remainders will form the digits from the um, from right up to left. So then you do 34, divide that by 2, it gives you 15, 17, remainder 0. 17 divided by 2 gives you, um, whatever it is, 8 and a half, so 8, remainder 1. 8 divided by 2 gives you 4, remainder 0. 4 divided by 2 is 2, remainder 0. 2 divided by 2 is 1, remainder 0. And one, when you divide that, you get nothing, remainder one. So you keep going over and over again until you finally get the zero at the bottom. Then these numbers reading upwards will then become the binary number. So you're getting that you get the one, then the zero, zero, zero. You get another one, zero, zero, one. So you get the same answer both ways. So you can see why some people approach like the decimal to binary straight away because dividing by two and working the remainder is pretty straightforward. You don't have to think that hard about dividing by two and what the remainder might be. The remainder is either a zero or one, and so it's pretty easy to work out the remainder. And you can, if you use a calculator, or even without a calculator, it's not hard to divide by two all the time. Converting to hex, um, divide by 16 and working the remainder is a little trickier. But you can see with hex, there's a lot less steps. And so, so oh, I prefer it for that reason, um, although the steps are just harder. So it's a trade-off, and then you can decide. So these are some um, techniques of being able to convert between different bases. And although I've used base 2 and base 16 in this point in time, the same rules apply to anything at all. So um, you can convert between various things. So just clarifying, let's just pick on... Um, this one here. So this is a number. A little subscript here means base six. And so what I want to do is I want to write one one four two base six into base ten, which we call decimal. And the way to go backwards and forwards. So to go from decimal into other bases, you just keep dividing essentially. To go from another base into decimal really just means keep multiplying. So two different ways of approaching it. Um, the Longer method, but you know, for all the examples I'll ever give, the it's pretty straightforward. Is to realise that each digit has a place value. The bottom one has a value of one. Next would have a value of the next base, so six in this case. Next one would have the base squared, which would be thirty-six. The next one would be the base cubed, which in this case is six cubed is two sixteen. So each one has a certain place value. Just like decimal, it's 1, 10, 100, 1,000, etc. And so basically you just multiply each number, so 1, times by its place value, plus the next digit, 1, times by its place value, plus the next digit times by its place value, plus etc. Equals whatever number that is, essentially. So that's the slow way, incidentally. Um, the other way is to do exactly opposite of what we did, and that is to do the um, uh, repeated multiplication. And, and the, so the repeated multiplication is basically you get the top digit, um, 1, multiply it by 6, so that gives you 6. Then you add on the next digit, so plus 1, um, gives you... Um, 7, and then you multiply that one by 6, so 42, plus the next digit, so 4, um, gives you 46, um, then you multiply that one by 6, so just keep going down, so that would give you 
six, 24 to 276. Then you add on the last digit, two, and you get 278. And you, know, you keep going. So pretty much what I'm doing is every time I get a digit, multiply it by six, add the next one along. Multiply that by six, add the next one along, etc. So you can see I'm continuing multiplying by six every time. And that's the exact reverse of what we do. You get the number. That's exactly equivalent to the top one. Now for a computer, this bottom approach is actually doing less calculations overall. Um, because working at these higher powers requires a bit more computation time. So for a computer, this bottom approach is actually quicker. Um, for a person, for a small case, certainly if you know what the powers are, it seems maybe a bit unusual way of doing it, but they are equivalent. Um, and you're not a computer, you're an actual person, so you might prefer the top way, that's fine. And there's lots of, so being on a convert to basis is, is critical. So, um, um, any questions with that for the moment? So other things that are, other skills are important um, to do that is being able to try to add and subtract things. So um, how would I do um, one of those and then I'll come back to the question someone raised with the assignment. Okay, so let's just try um, practicing some arithmetic. So the way to do arithmetic in different bases is how you did it when you're at school, uh, primary school. So I before you had a calculator in all intents and purposes. So the way you do a subtraction or addition or multiplication um, in particular, we're all using column ideas. So you have to write them down so the digits line up in terms of columns. That was really critical if you remember that. Now you're probably out of practice, um, even if you're straight out of high school, um, which you guys may not be. Um, if you're straight out of high school, then it still was a long time ago because you've just used a calculator so much. Um, so sometimes these are better. Sometimes you can get away with these by converting from base six in this case to decimal, both the decimal, and then adding them up in decimals because that's easy to do in a calculator, and then converting them back to base six. But I think sometimes it's easiest to treat the problem. Thing directly. So I'll just do this algorithm for addition. So the way you do addition basically is you add up the things in the column. So you've got in this case, you go from the bottom one first, so four and five. So four plus five is nine in decimals, but I want to write that in terms of base six. So on base six, well nine's bigger than six, um, so it's going to be one, six, and three remainder. So I write the bottom number, three, and I have to carry the one. And so the way I used to do it at primary school is I write my carry digits just underneath the bottom. So now I'm supposed to be going up. So next one I just add up the two numbers, so four and the three, seven, plus, plus the carry bit, so plus the, um, the um, one to gives me eight. And same thing again. That's bigger than six, so I have to divide by six and I've got a two remainder, and I have the one I'm being carried. And same thing again. So you can see three plus four plus one gives you the same thing, so that's another two, carry the one. And then 1 plus 1 plus 4 gives you 6. So again, it's more than 6. And so I put down a divide by 6, gives you no remainder, plus 1 over. So the answer is 1, 0, 2, 2, 3, base 6. And you can do this, and all the algorithms you did at primary school about column addition, column subtraction, column multiplication, etc., carry on to different bases. The main thing is you just have to be careful of how you carry those numbers essentially. So uh, just go remember that. So if you had a multiplication, so if you had four times by five, for example, that gives you 20. So 20 in decimal, which is what we're thinking of it, you have to divide it by six. So I'm going to by six, I'm going to get three sixes with a two remainder. So in base six, that would be looking as a three, two. And you have to think about what the king's being carried in harder situations. So I can do more examples in a second if you wish, but you really just have to think about what the, the algorithm you did when you were at primary school. Now, I'll be honest, you may have completely forgotten it. Um, and so I can I go through it, and, and that's quite understandable. So just before I do anything more about different bases, let's just um, uh, go through the quantum question. So in the assignment, um, 
there is a question about um, the Hilbert's Grand Hotel. And so the question is, um, okay, so yeah, I've thought hard, I worked out what the answer is. So I, I can, um, I got an idea of how to move the guests around. How do I demonstrate it? Um, so, and the answer is, um, I don't mind so much. But basically, my recommendation is, um, write it as a bunch of instructions that the receptionist or receptionists um, could give to the guests. So pretty much. So that's what you need to do. So at the end of the day, you need to give a bunch of instructions that people could actually follow. So an example of instruction people couldn't follow, for example, is um, so person in room number one, room to room to move a fair, an infinite number of rooms up. That's an instruction someone can't follow. They just can't do that. But you could say person in room number one, you move to room number seven. Okay, I could do that. So, um, but you want to give a set of instructions that people could, you know, everyone could listen to at the same time effectively. So just a bunch of English sentences would be perfectly acceptable. Um, you can do it other way. So um, Hilbert's Grand Hotel really is ultimately, um, you can think of them as being different cannibal sets. So it's equivalent to that. So you can describe it in functions if you wanted to, but I think it's just easy to use a bunch of words. I think that's really clearer to you. But I would accept being able to specify functions if you could think of it that way. Um, but yeah, so I'll leave it to you. Um, and I, 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 I'm not mark. I don't mark anything. Just by the way, I get someone else to do that. But my instructions to the marker, which I've already written, are on those lines. I mean, as long as what's been written makes sense, that's worth marks. Um, and that's what I'm looking for. But you know, English is probably going to be clearer. So, any other questions about the um, assignment? Why you got me on it? I can see you typing away there. I can see you typing, so I'm just waiting for the, what's coming up. Thanks for writing. Okay. Um, okay, so with the by conditional proof, how are solving proofs that work towards a single conclusion different from solving biconditional proofs? Um, okay, so um, the way to prove, um, sorry, we want to prove two things. Are equivalent. So that's basically what we're trying to do. So we've got to, in general, this is a general proof um, concept. We're trying to prove two things are equivalent. Um, so how can you, you do that sort of stuff? Um, and so one idea is so you're basically trying to say that A is equivalent to. B. So often how you want to do that is you basically want to, so option one, so this is lots of different options. One option is to prove that A is something like less than B and B is less or equal to A and that sort of concept. And you know, what does that mean? So in terms of sets, that would be A is a subset of B and B is a subset of A, that's what less than mean, less than equal means. In terms of logic, so if you had a bunch of propositional logic, so um, true or false statements, less than or equal to would be A implies B. 
and B implies A. You have to do them both. So that's what less than or equal to looks like in that sort of logic situation. So you can see that this is a general rule and you can say they apply in special circumstances. Um, I can't remember the exact question you're referring to the assignment, which is why, partly why I'm a bit general. So that's one way of doing it. So you, you can prove two both directions separately, but that ain't the only way of doing it. Um, the other way is, is you've basically got um, A and then you do a bunch of rules. Um, each rule, each step you take is clearly um, an equivalent statement. So you've got lots of different steps. I don't know what their steps are. But if each step really is a bike, is a, can bow both ways, there's a clear equivalency. And so each of these, for an example, these equivalencies might be a rule of logic. So a rule of logic or a rule of sets or a rule of Boolean algebra really is a statement that is equivalency. It just says this thing is equivalent to that one. And so if I can say A is equivalent to C, etc., to B, then that implies that A must be equivalent to B. And normally have you write that down in terms of maths, these would just be equal signs. So A equals C equals D equals E equals B, therefore A equals B. That's fine. So each of the, basically, our, if we have our basic steps being that way, it's fine. Um, where that doesn't always work is when these little statement steps you're going cannot be reversed so clearly, that's when you have to start going back to more step one. And so sometimes the, this basic approach of showing both directions is required. If you've got the, if you've got the right sort of rules at your disposal, then that number two is fine. And other, so that basic approach is using rules of logic Others are, other sort of approaches is to simplify the problem into a really clear picture. And so they things like, say, Venn diagrams as we do for equivalency. So if the pictures are the same, or truth tables is another sort of way. So if you make, if you convert them to truth tables, then you can see quite visually if the numbers match up or not, if they're the same. And basically they're just trying to simplify down their representation something you can just pick out, oh bang, they're the same there or not. So there's sort of different approaches to show things equivalent. And the way to do it for sets and logic are really similar, close related. And the reason for that is because they're both um, a top of Boolean algebra. And so they have the same structure to them and therefore the proofs are the same sort of structure. So, sorry, that was speaking really generally. Um, I'm not sure if that assisted in your thinking one, um, one iota. I can speak to more about the question in, uh, you had in your mind, if you want. I'm looking at the assignment now. Just from all the questions. So, um, yeah, I mean, so there's, so why I've phrased this general terms is because there's several questions really about showing things equivalent. So, um, 1C is about showing equivalency of two sets. And you could do it using rules of logic or rules of sets, or you could do it visually using a Venn diagram, or you could show it, um, yeah, the two, two parts. And I mean, 1C, you can do anything you want to. The visual approach is probably easier. Um, but what else is the one you're referring to? Was truth tables by two A? I presume is the question you're referring to. Um, and one B, that sort of thing. So um, yeah, so two A. So two A is just basically just doing a more of a visual approach. Essentially, is what I've actually. I you can use other way. I've left it open really. So my suggestion is to use truth tables, which is a visual approach, but there's no thing stopping you, um, and I wouldn't mark it all correct, if you did one of the other approaches, like just a bunch of rules of logic to go from one to another, I really don't mind. Um, but they're all equivalent to each other. Um, I'm not sure if I explain why. Um, but, um, they sort of are. Okay. 
Cool. Well, um, do we want? Do you want me to cover this last question, um, or would you just happy to call it a day? Um, there's only so much mass you can take in one session normally. So, what would you guys like me to do? Not sure. <laughs> Um, I'll err on the side of um, I'll do it. Um, so this is another um, back to the base, um, different base number systems. Um, so we've got two numbers in base six. I want to multiply them together. Um, so one, four, five, four in base six, and two, four in base six. The way you do this um, is called column multiplication. Um, you can see I've left a big space in the middle here. So basically you multiply one digit at a time. So I'll do the four times by the four. So four times by four gives me um, 16, if you can decimals. And we have to convert that to base six. So divide that by six gives me two um, with a remainder of four. So I write down the remainder, four. And I write down my, I've got to run out of room here realize sorry let's make it really big so four times four is 16 which is um, two so a little two here for the carried um, two so that's the remainder and that's what that's the quotient then I do four times five which is 20 in your thinking in terms of um, decimals divide that by six gives me three Sorry, try to take that game. I've got 12 times 5 is 20. I have to add this 2, so I get 22. So I really should get, think of it as being 22 in decimals. Divide that by 6 gives me um, a 3. And the remainder is 4. So I'll write down the remainder here. Next one would be 4 times 4 is 16. Plus my 3 gives me 19. Again, divide by 3. Okay, divide by 6 gives me um, 3 of them. The remainder of 1. And then four times by one is four plus my um, three. I can't read my own writing very well. So four plus one, it says four plus three is give me seven. Divide that by six gives me a remainder of one and one left behind. So one, 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 four, two, by six. So that's just multiplying that whole thing by four. Then you want to do it for the next digit. And this is a step you have to remind, remember from school, and that is when you start multiplying the next one, that's really multiplying not by two, but really by two times six, or 12 in this case. It's really multiplying by 12. And so to, to keep remembering of that, we put a little bit of zero at the beginning, so just, and it shift everything along. So otherwise, multiply it by two, but just starting in the second column rather than the first column. And the way to do it is just to line it up. So that's all lined up in the same column. So then you do 2 times 4 is um, 8, divide by 6 gives you a remainder of 2, with 1 as the quotient, 2 fives are 10, plus 1 gives you 11, um, divide by um, 2 gives you a remainder of 5, and a quotient of 1, so it's 1 remainder of 5. Um, 2 fours are 8, plus 1 gives you 9. So a remainder of three and one and two, uh, one and two plus one gives you three. And now you've done those. Now we start, and you keep doing it for every single digit. So I finish all the digits and I add them up. So I do two plus zero is two, two plus four is six. But we're using base six. We have to write down divide by six gives me a remainder of zero and a carry of one. Five plus one is six plus one gives you seven. Divide by six in row number of one, carry of one. One plus one is two, plus three gives me five, and one plus three gives me four. So I didn't have carry in every single situation. And so the final answer, if I haven't made a mistake, which is possible, is four, five, one, zero, two. And let's put a little base six down here to remind ourselves it is base six and not decimals. In an assignment, like you do for assignment two, I would do it a different approach just to check my answer. So I would convert this number to decimal. 
both these numbers to decimal, do my calculation on calculator, and then go backwards, convert back, just to so get the same answer, Let's, to make sure I'm on the right track. In an exam situation, you probably don't have the time to do that. No, that's okay. Um, so things get marked slightly differently accordingly. But that's a good approach. So I hope that sort of helps just to clear up some of this sort of stuff. Um, so all the best with the assignment. If you've got any last minute questions about the assignment, um, fire away, of course, um, um, via email, or you can do it now, but it's only via email otherwise. Um, and I will see you guys next week and we'll do um, what I call counting. Um, so combinatorics is the fancy way. So counting makes it sound like you're something you do um, in preschool. It's not quite, it's, it's not, certainly not that simple, unfortunately. Um, but it's a common or common or makes it sound something that you know more university sounding perhaps but it is really about counting stuff but anyway um, I will see you guys next week thanks for attending